go. Okay, today, which is now tomorrow, was the 20th of the Hebrew month of Cheshvin. And this time we're particularly talking about, it's the first yurt site of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, who was the chief rabbi of Great Britain. He was given the honorific title of Lord, uh, which of course in British uh, government has some significance. And also I should point out, was the birth date of the fifth Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab. His birthday was the tw- is the 20th of Cheshvin. But tonight we decided in honor of Rabbi Sachs to talk about him and about his life. So it's cu- quite curious. Uh, first of all, I should maybe give a little background to what this term chief rabbi means. The previous chief rabbi who preceded Rabbi Sachs was a man, his name was Rabbi Emanuel Jacobowitz. Uh, he's passed away. I actually met him just in my own life experience when I was about 18. I met him at a wedding, and I didn't understand at the time what that meant, chief rabbi. And being an 18-year-old know-it-all American, I was like, hey, you know, chief, where are all the Indians? So the concept of chief rabbi, which we don't have, of course, in the United States, but in Europe, historically, always really carried an extremely significant uh, stature. It is essentially the ambassador of the Jewish people to the government in England. There is, he, he conducts an entire um, network of synagogues. It's called the United Synagogue. Um, closest thing that we maybe have in, in America, though it's not very popular here in Chicago, it's more of an East Coast thing, is the young Israel. He is the uh, spokesman for the Jewish people. He's much more of an ambassador, Rabbi Sachs was, and much more of a representative of the Jewish people socially and in the formality, you know, going to royal weddings and things that were not uh, uh, sort of part of our U.S. culture, but are very much and highly, highly regarded in British culture, um, more than he is the halachic authority, although that is, in fact, his title. He is the Av Bezdin. He is the halachic authority for those who consider the uh, chief rabbi to be their halachic ruler. Um, but he does represent, that is the position of chief rabbi, represents the entire Jewish community of Great Britain, uh, Australia, Canada, uh, et cetera. Now, again, it's a very different system than we have here in this country, um, but it has a lot more formality. You know, in England, they have faith schools, they are, they are Jewish and other religious schools that are funded by the government. And they're also private yeshivas. It's just a very different tone and milieu. Now, he became chief rabbi in 1991. As I said, he succeeded after Rabbi Jacobowitz. Rabbi Jacobowitz was, I think we would say, more of what we think of as a halachic rav. He was a great uh, hosek, a great halachic decisor in many medical ethics issues, which he wrote about. And he, too, was a great representative of the Jewish people. Rabbi Sachs was much more of a rabbi than a rav. (laughs) That is, he was much more of an ambassador of Jewish thought and the Jewish message that went beyond just the Jewish community. He was a great representative of Jewish ideas and values to the broader secular world. Now, he not only, I mean, his his oratory skills and his presentation, he made Judaism look beautiful and attractive. I mean, you could listen to him read the phone book. You know, he had just this melodious, British accent, and at the same time, and I mean this as an absolute um, compliment, his brother was recently interviewed and he said, you know, my brother, referring to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, was much more fun at 60 than he was at six. You know, when he was a kid, he was very much uh, the studious one, always in the coat and tie and so on. And as he grew older, he became much more uh, of a fun person. In one of his books, and he wrote numerous books, and I highly recommend all of them. He always has self-deprecating humor. I once heard him speak and he said, I don't have time to read 300 page books only to write them. But one beautiful little vignette that always struck me was in one of his books, it's called Celebrating Life, the cover is the picture of him and his wife, Elaine, known as Lady Elaine. And I always thought that was very humming. Here's a man, you know, who we would say hobnob with the biggest of big shots in government, in uh, academia. But what he always spoke about is his, his, uh, in, in a modest way, his romantic love 
for his wife. And he had, they have three children, you know, who are, of course, grown adults. Now, curiously, Rabbi Sachs always identified three primary influences on his spiritual development. The Rebbe, which is one of the reasons why he's a favorite of ours. Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was the dean of the Yeshiva University and a great rabbinic authority uh, who lived in Boston, and his personal teacher, Rabbi Nachum Rabinovitz. Now, Rabbi Sachs grew up in a very Jewish home. His father was an immigrant. He was, a, he was not a scholar. He was not a rabbi. He was a, a, a somewhat apparently successful um, man of, of, of business. His mother did come from somewhat of a rabbinic family. When he was a young boy, there weren't really a day school option. He went to what we would call a public school. They called it, I think, a state school. And curiously, I don't remember the specific name. If I did, I wouldn't repeat it because it's some Christian name. You know, all of their schools are named J this, C this. You know, it's that whole English style. But that was not uncommon at that time in the 50s. He was born in the late 40s. He was 71 when he passed away. Um, he, uh, it was not uncommon at that time for, uh, for Jewish people, even what we would call, quote, religious people, whereas today we always assume that they're going to be in Hader at that time. And he had no aspirations of ever becoming a rabbi. That was not on his radar. However, he did go to study in Israel in the Chabad Yeshiva. It's called Kfar Chabad, located in the Chabad village. And I've heard him tell the story, and you can Google it because he tells it so much better than I can with many more details. And of course, his melodious, beautiful voice. But he tells one of the most profound stories and impacts in his life was that in the late 60s, you know, it was a time of a lot of upheaval, a lot of searching. Jewish life was sort of in flux. Israel had won the Six Day War. People were feeling a great pride. Zionism was high, high on the rise. A great deterioration in relig religious observance was going on. Jews were starting to assert themselves socially and economically and in the business world throughout the, the world and particularly in the United States. And he received a grant from the B'nai B'rith to travel to the United States and Canada to interview great Jewish thinkers, philanthropists, business people, scholars, academics, and so forth. He arrived in the United States, you know, and that was a much bigger deal to fly across the country. And he bought, and this sounds like crazy to us, he bought a Greyhound bus pass that he could go anywhere in the United States and Canada for the entire summer. Can you imagine? And when he arrived, he was told, oh, you know, you're telling people what he's doing. People said to him, you must see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. You must see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So, of course, being a little unfamiliar with the protocol, he called up and said, hi, I'm a college student um, in Cambridge, and I would like to see the Rebbe. You know, I can be there in half an hour. <laughs> he said, well, you know, it doesn't work that way. You got to take a number. Where can we reach you? He said, well, you know, it could be weeks. We don't know. I mean, the Rebbe's appointment book is, is, is filled. He said, well, I'll be at my sister's house in Los Angeles at such and such a time. Here's a phone number, imagine before cell phones. He travels around the United States and Canada. He interviews all of these different people about what is their vision for the future of the Jewish people? What should we do? And they were brilliant people and loving people and incredibly devoted to the Jewish people and to developing a, a, a path for the Jewish people. He, as he tells the story, he arrives in Los Angeles, imagine cross country into Canada on this Greyhound bus. And the way he tells it, maybe mildly exaggerated for effect, as he walks in the door of his sister's house, the phone rings. Hello? Hi, this is the laboratory of his office. We have an appointment for Mr. Sachs. Can you be here in three days? I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but that's the way he tells it back on the Greyhound bus all the way back and he arrives in the Rebbe's study. He walks in and he has been doing this already for some period of time and he's got this whole ledger of the brilliant ideas. And he sits down across from the Rebbe and he says, and this I've heard him say so many times, the Rebbe said to him, what are you doing for Jewish life in Cambridge? He was a student in Cambridge and the Rebbe said, what are you doing for Jewish life in Cambridge? And his immediate reaction is, no, 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 I asked the questions here. Why are you asking me what I'm doing? And this struck him and it made an absolute imprint on him literally for the rest of his life. Everybody else that he went to was very eager to share with him their vision for the Jewish people. And the rebel was the only one was unique in saying to him, what are you doing for the Jewish people? And now he never thought of himself as quote, doing something for the Jewish people. He never thought of himself as being in any type of position of 
leadership amongst the Jewish people. He had plans on becoming an academic, a philosopher, or a, a lawyer, or as they say, of course, a barrister. And when he says it, you like you melt, you know, the way he says it. And this would this completely turned his life upside down. This is, he's, I've heard him described many times, and you can Google it, where he spoke at the Shluchan Convention and in other audiences, not just, you know, Chabad audiences, when he says that they go crazy with rhythmic clapping, even uh, audiences that aren't predisposed to, uh, to only wanting to hear stories about the Rebbe. And he describes that the, this is what the Rebbe implanted in his mind, that he needs to take a degree of responsibility. He came back, and as I said, he got engaged to his wife, Elaine, and he decided to go and spend some time in yeshiva, which was really unique for him. Uh, he hadn't had a yeshiva education, and he went to Kfar Chabad in Israel. And he describes this in a very honest and, 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 and sort of raw manner that he became a little concerned. He was becoming so much, sort of too much Chabad, and he didn't know if his wife would still want to marry him. So while he always spoke about it and honored it and cherished it, there was a little bit of discomfort there in how much it was. He came back, he got married. Um, he tells a story about how he almost drowned and some stranger saved his life on their honeymoon. And he said, this became another model for him about how strangers can touch somebody and literally saved his life. He was almost swept out to sea uh, somewhere that they had gone. And he was very involved and very uh, friendly with the, with the people in Lubavitch. And he was thinking, okay, you know, I'm married now and it's time to grow up and I can't just be a, reading books all day and being a, an academic, I need to make my decision. So he, just, he was strongly encouraged, as you can imagine, to go and speak with the rabbi. So he asked his friends in Lubavitch, many of them are still with us, thank God, and he said, you know, what's the protocol? So they said, the protocol is you write a letter and you give the rabbi like choices, what it is that you'd like to be, and the rabbi will give some direction to you. So he followed instructions. He's had a sort of a, a somewhat of an understanding of the proper protocol. And he came to the Rebbe and he gave the Rebbe this list. And on it were three options. Again, a philosopher, an academic, a professor, or a barrister. And the Rebbe looked up and said, I think you should go into the rabbinate and return to Jews College, which is an institution that had fallen into great disrepair, which Rabbi Sachs rebuilt which was a Jews college. It was a, a college level for people to become rabbis. It's now it's a thriving institution, but at that time it had sort of fallen into this repair. It was meant for rabbis to have ongoing education, even though rabbis think they know everything already. And so, and his first reaction, no, no, see, that's not the rules. The rules are, you're supposed to pick one of these. But to his great credit, he followed the Rebbe's guidance and of course went into Jews College, rebuilt and became the dean of it. And of course became a rabbi first in the synagogue, uh, in the United Synagogue and ultimately chief rabbi. So the rabbi thing kind of worked out. And as he often points out, over the course of his ex experience, he was given honorary, honorary titles in philosophy and in law, as well as in economics. So he kind of got to, to live all of his uh, aspirations. He describes numerous, he only met the Rebbe three times. It's not like he was there all the time. He says one time the Rebbe asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, in this sort of very standard British manner, he said, in the situation in which I find myself. And he says, the only time, the only time the Rebbe ever interrupted him was when he said, in the situation in which I find myself. And the Rebbe said, a Jew, or maybe said a person, I don't know, does not find himself in a situation. He puts himself in a situation. If you put yourself in the situation, you can get yourself out of the situation. And it said, again, he was, it, it changed his life. We're not victims of our circumstance. We make our choices. Hashem directs us where we need to go. A Jew doesn't find himself like it's a mistake. He puts himself in his, in his um, situation, in where he finds himself. You know, of course, over the course of his career, he was called upon to represent the Jewish people. And you know, some people liked with his decisions, other people liked it even more. Uh, he wrote numerous books and what he really did is he made Jewish life, and I think more so in Europe than in America, because America has got a little bit more of that um, sort of re reverence for kind of out there cowboy stuff. And if you wanna be a firm Jew in America, 
there is a, a certain degree that thinks that maybe that's kind of cool, but that sort of English, you know, very sort of straight laced. And it was very unusual. And it was that way, I think, in this country 50 years ago as well, um, for people in Britain to be openly Jewish and wear yarmulkes and beards and so on. And it was seen as strange and they lived in weird places. You know, that all of that stereotype that is often associated with Torah Yiddishkeit was even that much more so in, in England. You know, it's, it's, it's a different culture and so on. And he made Yiddishkeit, I'm going to use this word, it's probably a silly word. He made it beautiful. He made it attractive. He was a picture of representation. He, he was, you know, as they say, put together, not only, I'm not talking about a shallow Hollywood way, but the way in which he carried himself, the way in which he always seemed to have the right answer. He always knew how to diffuse 10 situations. He always knew how to bring a message. After 9-11, of course, I would say, see, see what religion does. He knew how to do it. He wrote books about it. He wrote books about diversity. He brought Torah and Torah values and messages to a secular world and in a manner in which they could see the reverence and respect for Torah. He was, in that sense, a great, a great, great ambassador for Torah. He had, there's a website that has his writings, numerous books, lectures that you can find on YouTube, always with a sense of humor, always very self-deprecating. And again, remember that British formality, it sounded very rigid and everybody is sort of, you know, very stiff and he's the chief rabbi and so on, but he's always comes across as very down to earth, as very interpersonal. The way he speaks so lovingly, just as an example, uh, even after he retired, he used to have what we would call basically a podcast, a five or six minute Devar Torah that he would do, you know, so regal sitting there you know, in his beautiful chair. And one of the, I still, I'm a big fan. I was watching it. And in the middle, his cell phone rang. And it was so sweet because he said, oh, I'm sorry. It's my grandson calling to wish me good Shabbos. You know, whereas he could be so ruffled. How dare you? Don't you know I'm the chief rabbi? But he was, he was so zany-ish in that one moment. It was, it, 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 it effused, not phony. It effused a sweet, not even patronized. Oh, you know, isn't that cute? He, he became so gushy for, for a moment, you know, that he, sh and he wasn't ashamed. You know, it, it's not live. He could have done, he could have done an outtake. He could have said, okay, cut, now let's do it again. You know, with this false goal on seven, you Huffington, Washington, you know, he wasn't. He, he, he really communicated that in a beautiful, beautiful way. As he said, he doesn't have regrets, except that he doesn't have more time to spend with his family, with his children. To hey, Nishma say, Zachary, may his soul be a, a memory of blessing. A, uh, and a blessing that we recall him. Today is his first yard site. Google around, you'll find his talks, you'll find his writings, you'll find his books. They're, they're wonderful, brilliant, insightful, and very warm. So I just wanted to share it. As you can tell, I'm a big fan. I used to say I have all his albums and uh, you know the, the throw pillows and so on, but um, I really do admire a lot of his works. Unfortunately, they're now on the internet, so everyone knows where I steal all my good Bartoras from. There's a guy who used to print them. I said, can't print them out. That's where I get all my good stuff from. Now I'm just going to know. But um, uh, I, I would strongly recommend just Google around. There's so much. He has a website, rabbisax.org. You can get, you know, the email you or whatever you want. His writings uh, on the Parsha, always with an interesting twist, always with something. Just to share one more thought and we'll be gone. As I mentioned, he was a philosopher. He was a lover of great classical music. He was a real Renaissance man. And he once shared with the Rebbe, that he was concerned that if he's gonna become so involved in Torah, he's gonna to lose his appreciation for the other forms of art in the world. Now, we might've anticipated the Rebbe would say, what do you mean Torah is the best and we don't need none of that nonsense? You know, the Rebbe didn't say that. The Rebbe said, on the contrary, the more you become engaged in Torah, the more you will be sensitized to see greater and greater beauty in music, in art, in nature, in philosophy. It was a fascinating response, the question and answer. He was genuinely concerned. And rather than we might have anticipated the Rebbe saying, oh, fooey on that, all that nonsense. You know, we, the Rebbe said, Torah will refine you and make you more and more sensitized to appreciate the other beauties that exist in Hashem's great world. So he was a great representative ambassador of the Jewish people, never shied away from some pretty rough stuff. And again, you know, anytime you're in the decision-making capacity, Somebody's not going to like the decision that you made, 
So he had people, but I don't think he had anybody. There was one incident, which I don't want to recount because it's unpleasant, but he didn't attend a certain person's funeral and people were blown up about it. And that man's wife wrote in an article, I want you to know that Rabbi Sachs has been of utmost respect and reverence for whatever reason, he wasn't able to attend the funeral, but I have no malice towards him. He always showed us with kindness. So even the people who disagreed with him had great reverence and respect for him. He was a great man. It's today's his first yard site and a great ambassador of the Jewish people. And again, I encourage you to Google around Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, it's even the fact that he uses his English name instead of Yaakov Tzvi, may his neshama be elevated on high and all of the mitzvahs that he encourages to people to do should accrue to his benefit in Shemayim. And that everybody will see you tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll send out the recording.